Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Pitt Greensburg's vir virtual town hall for students. My name is Lee Hoffman. I'm the Assistant Dean of Student Services, and I will be serving as the host and moderator of this webinar. I'm now going to introduce our panelists for today. Dr. Jackie Horrell is the Vice President for Academic Affairs. Dr. Frank Wilson is our Assistant Vice President for Academic Affairs. Ms. Beth Tiedemann is our Director of Advising and Registrar. Mr. Joe Bleehash is our Director of Facilities and Operations. Mr. Troy Ross is the Director of Housing and Residence Life. Mr. Brian Root is the Assistant Director of Housing and Residence Life. And Mr. Rick Fogel is our Dean of Student Services. Before we begin, I would like to mention a few reminders to those who are attending. We recommend that you put your screen on speaker view, which can be found in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Also, if you are in need of closed captioning, that button can be found at the bottom of your screen uh, if, you, if you need to activate that. We will be answering questions after each panelist speaks as well as at the conclusion of the presentation. To submit a question, you can either, either use the Q&A feature or the chat feature that are located at the bottom of your screen. So now we will get started and I will turn it over to Dr. Horrell. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to start by talking about the academic side of the house and Dr. Wilson will jump in um, uh, whenever he um, feels the need to. And then uh, Ms. Beth Tiedemann is going to talk about um, scheduling and advising related type, types of stuff. So I think since March, basically what we've been focused on is figuring out how we are going to provide an education for students in the fall, that is the best that we can do during this time. Right now, the posture of the university is what we're referring to as guarded risk. Basically what that means is that some of our, or most of our operations can be in person, but it's going to involve some remote um, operations as well. For the students, what this means is that the student will have the option of being physically on campus. There will be some courses that will be offered in person, and there are some courses that will be offered remotely. Our goal is to make sure that we offer courses to the students in a way that um, is flexible. In other words, we are not sure what the situation of each individual student and faculty is in the fall. And so we have adopted a model of instruction and learning that is going to hopefully cover all the bases. So students will have the option to take classes in person where possible, but they will also have the option to um, take their classes remotely, and I'll explain a little bit. So this model of instruction and learning that I'm talking about, we refer to it as, as uh, flex at pit. Really what it does is where possible, a class is offered in person, a student who is on campus or is able, given their situation, to be on campus can take that class as usual. So you would go to your assigned classroom and you would meet in person with your faculty and other students. If, if you, the student, is unable to be on campus, so you can't take that class face-to-face, -face, then you have the option of uh, accessing that class remotely. In some cases, you will be able to access the class synchronously, meaning that you're, you're viewing the class live, and you probably would have the option to participate in that class, ask questions as the class is occurring. In other cases, you can access that class asynchronously, so at your 
uh, leisure, you can access the class. And, uh, and so that's one side of, of, of what we're offering. Other classes will be offered remotely only. And these classes can be offered either synchronously or synchronously or asynchronously. By doing this, what we're hoping is that the students will have options, um, whatever their situation is. So you can choose to be in person or you can choose to access your classes remotely. Uh, if you're on campus, I encourage you, where possible, to attend your class in person uh, because we believe that that might be the um, preferred way for most students anyway, and some students will learn uh, more effectively that way. But in any event, you have the choice between remote and in person. We're operating under some constraints, however. So in order to ensure that if you're on campus, you're, we, you're gonna be there in a safe environment, we have had to revise uh, the a number of students who can be in a classroom at any given time. So a class that typically would hold 35 may now hold nine, which means that if there are 30 people enrolled in the class, not everybody can be in that classroom at the same time. So your instructor may be talking to you about how they plan to operate such a class. And there are different models that they can follow. For example, an instructor may um, decide that to give students the option to rotate through the class. So some come on Monday, some come on Wednesday, or it might be a specific um, number of you who decide that you want to be in class and you'll attend class every day. That is something that you will work out um, uh, with your instructor, but we're also planning to try to gauge what you plan to do in the fall so that we can uh, uh, be better prepared to teach you. So expect a survey sometime soon about uh, which classes you plan to do in person and which classes you plan to do remotely. Uh, some students have been asking whether or not uh, they would be able to uh, do their uh, to, to do the semester entirely uh, fully remote? And the answer to that is yes, we should be able to do that with a couple exceptions. So um, the answer to that question might be different for nursing students. And I recommend that you contact Dr. Uh, Marie Fioravanti uh, if you have questions about that. Education, there might be some instances where fully remote is not a possibility because you may have student teaching or something uh, where it's externally controlled. So in those cases, it's best to speak with your pro someone from your program, but generally uh, you, may, um, you should be able to access all of your classes remotely, even the ones that are being offered in person. And I know I'm leaving out stuff, but I only have five minutes, so I'm gonna throw it over to Dr. Wilson to see if he wants to add anything. Thanks, Jackie. Um, what I just want to emphasize is that the faculty has been working all summer trying to figure out how we're going to be teaching in a way we haven't done before. This flex model is new to us. Um, we actually have a class going on right now where we're testing out um, this simulcast um, remote combination. Um, what I would say is that if you're part of an in-person class, the class will be recorded um, so that we will, uh, you will have access um, at any time to, to the course material. Um, and you'll be able to catch up um, by watching the lectures and looking at the uh, materials that have been placed on our learning management system, which is called Canvas. Um, I would just say that um, this is this presents a real opportunity for you as students um, because you're going to be part of the experiment along with us and for it to work there has to be interaction between faculty and students there's going to be need for um, students to be trained uh, in in some of this technology to be able to assist faculty who are teaching in person and having it simulcast. So um, 
as as was just mentioned, there'll be surveys coming out, but but realize that there's going to be a, a lot of opportunities to work closely with with uh, faculty from your majors that would be more than normal, and you will be able to contribute. So I think that's all I would uh, want to uh, add at this point. And if we have questions, um, we'll be happy to address those. There is one question in the Q&A right now. Uh, the question is, what if students who are residing on, what if students who are residing on campus do not want to take any classes remotely? So not all of our classes are able to be offered in person for various different reasons. Social distancing constraint is, is one of them um, because we have limited uh, uh, available space. But the other is, one of our biggest concern is everybody's safety, faculty, staff, and students. And so we have, we don't expect people who are in, um, say, a compromised position to be on campus uh, because we don't want anybody who, are, who might be uncomfortable with the situation, worried about, contracting the virus, we don't want to force them to be here. We also, whether they're faculty or students, uh, some people may have other legitimate reasons why they cannot be on campus in the fall, and we want to make sure that people have the option to get the education, to be able to take their courses regardless of their personal circumstances. And that means that we have to make some kind of compromise. So some faculty are not able to be on campus because of their personal situation, and so those classes cannot be offered in person. Likewise, some students cannot be on campus because of their personal situations, and they will be able to take those classes remotely. Okay, we have a few more questions. Um, somebody would like to know, how are they going to handle the price difference of classes going online instead of in person? Maybe we would raise the price of the online. It's so much more work. I'm joking. Uh, I don't think the university has um, uh, made any decision to differentiate in the prices. Our intention is to make sure that whether the course is offered online or in person, that you're getting a good quality um, course and that you're going to get out of it what as, as much as you, we could possibly get out of this it under this these circumstances um, someone else would like to know is there any form of prioritization for instance is there any priority based off of year in school or if that class is part of their major do you mean for registration for um, who gets to be in the class personally uh, i'm not sure could, could the person expand on that question a little bit Sure. If you, Go ahead, Jackie. I was going to say, if they mean if there is any priority given to the number to who gets the seats in the class, what we're trying to do is, as much as possible, accommodate each individual's circumstances. And I'm sure that we won't always be able to do so, but we're going to try our best. If, if the person wants to... Um, explain a little bit further i'll try to answer later it looks like that answered the question for them okay um, someone else would like to know when will we find out whether a class is remote or in person very soon and i'm going to actually wait um, for um miss tiedemann to give you the answer to that question we're currently working on the schedule and updated updating the information so you'll be seeing that soon she'll be able to give you a little bit more detail Okay, um, I think some of the other questions are um, looking like there's some people who have asked some questions about a, about the dining hall and some other things and mass and I know we're going to be talking about that. So I'll defer to that uh, later. Um, does anybody have any other questions um, that they would like to ask before we move on to uh, Ms. Tiedemann? Okay, so I think we'll uh, move on to uh, Beth at this point. 
Okay, thanks, Lee. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, in detail about what to expect in terms of your classes and um, the time frame for these changes. So we have been um, working really hard behind the scenes over the past um, month and a half to uh, gather all of the adjustments that faculty are requesting and then um, reconfigure the schedule based on the changes to the room capacity. Um, the good news is that we are almost done with that process. So if you were, um, what we're going to change first in PeopleSoft are all of the classes that have been moved to a remote um, learning arrangement. So when you go in your student center, um, starting over the weekend, you will see classes that no longer have rooms assigned to them. And those are the web-based classes. And it will either say web-based or it will say online. And then the classes that will be offered asynchronously, that means there's no day or time for those classes assigned. Um, those classes will have the day and the time removed as well, and they'll be blank. There are very few asynchronous classes. Most of the classes are still going to meet at their scheduled times, and but you'll simply be taking the class um, from your computer um, in your room or at your home. Um, once we finish making those adjustments in PeopleSoft, we will then be making the changes to the in-person classes. Now, this is another piece of um, what I think is actually really terrific and positive news. Um, I don't know if anybody out there was concerned about classes being canceled or times being changed and um, you know that leading to schedule overhauls. I can tell you that that has not happened. Um, we have over 400 classes, and so far there are only two classes that have been canceled, and one class had three students, and I think the other class had two students. So at this point, um, changes to class offerings is absolutely minimal. Um, the classes that are being offered in person, the things that will change most are the rooms, the, where those classes are located. Um, some classes will be offered in person one day a week and then remotely on the other day. So you will see changes to the meeting patterns of your classes. That's something else that I would encourage you to pay attention to. So again, um, starting over the weekend, you can look at your class schedule and you should see any classes that have been moved to solely remote. Um, by next Tuesday or Wednesday in your student center, we should be finished with all of the adjustments to um, the meeting patterns for the in-person classes. The last thing we will do is put up a new schedule of classes. Some of you probably use that when you're scheduling your classes for the upcoming semester. Um, it's a PDF that we um, create using an Excel spreadsheet. That will be the last thing we do. So um, no changes will be made until we've finished making the changes in PeopleSoft. And um, the way PeopleSoft works, it's, it happens in real time. So I also, I'm glad that you're all on this call and um, please know that this is um, what you're seeing happening with your classes for the fall is happening in real time. There's no way for us to do it behind the scenes in PeopleSoft and then make it live. So um, you, we would encourage you to check and, and there'll be a, an email that will go out to all students letting them know when the changes are finished. Um, as in any semester, some additional changes happen over the weeks leading up to the semester, but we would expect that by the middle to end of next week, all of the major changes in PeopleSoft will be finished. So then the next step is for you to think about, um, do you need or want to make any changes to your schedule based on the new um, learning arrangements for the classes that you have? Um, for some of you, you know, if you're a junior or a senior, you may really want to keep all the classes that you have because they're 
critical in terms of your course sequencing. Um, but if you have, um, for instance, a general education requirement where you've got different options, um, or it's a course in your major, but there's a couple of different sections, certainly I would encourage you to explore your options and you can do that on your own, but I would recommend consulting with an academic advisor um, to really make sure you've considered all of the possibilities. Um, I would recommend contacting your advisor to make an appointment and you can do that one of two ways. You can email them directly or you can call the Academic Advising Center and that number is 724-836-9940. Um, and as with all the offices on campus, our phones are forwarded to Google Voice. So, um, you know, that call will go make its way through to Lisa Pletcher, who does appointment scheduling. Um, you can also, for those of you who have um, been corresponding with an advisor over the summer, we are all using Microsoft Teams and you can reach out to your advisor that way as well. Um, any, any one of those is fine. An email, um, reaching out through Teams or calling the office. You've got plenty of time. Classes don't start until August 19th. So um, I encourage you to take your time with the decision. You don't wanna give up a spot in a class you really need until you're certain that you're ready to let that go. Um, I know these are important um, and sometimes difficult decisions. We want you to be successful in the fall. So it's important that you consider um, your classes in totality, you know, what's going to be, what's going to set you up for success, what, um, what arrangements will be best for you. And um, the other thing that will be happening, I think, is that you'll be getting additional information from your faculty about how they plan to offer their classes, um, you know, what, what they'll be doing if they're teaching remotely, um, how, how that's going to look and feel to you as a student. So again, I think I wouldn't rush to get out of a class until you know a little bit more. You can even reach out to your faculty um, and before the class starts and they may be able to share some details with you as well. Um, that is everything that was on my list that I wanted to cover and I'm happy to answer questions at this time. So we have a question that asks, for the fall semester, will the, will the satisfactory no credit option be offered again? If it is, will it be for all classes or just remote classes? That option, um, offering that option retroactively was um, specifically and only for the spring semester. However, um, most classes already have that satisfactory no credit option built in but you, in an, under regular circumstances, you need to choose that option within the first four weeks of the semester. So in the fall, that we will be back to that regular arrangement, which means you can choose to take a class, satisfactory, no credit. Um, for those of you who did not choose it in the spring, let me just tell you that the way that works is <clears throat> a satisfactory is considered equivalent to approximately a grade of C. So if you earn a C or higher in that course, instead of a letter grade, you will receive an S on your transcript for that class. Um, that grading option is chosen on a class by class basis. So you could look at your schedule and pick one or two to take that way um, and leave the rest for letter grades. There is a limit on how many classes toward graduation you can take with a satisfactory no credit great option. So um, I, I believe because of the pandemic, there will be some flexibility with that, but um, you do need to be cautious about how many classes you choose. And I would recommend waiting until the class starts and um, again, take advantage of the time that we're giving you to really get in there and get comfortable in the class and then make that decision. Another question is how will lab courses be handled? Can we do those online? Lab, Jackie, do you want to answer that or would you like me to? I can, I can take a stab at it and you can um, correct me if I say something wrong. Um, so 
the, some of the lab classes will be virtual and your instructor will be um, telling you exactly how those are going to be done. Other lab classes will be done where every student will have an opportunity if they are on campus, if they want face-to-face, -face, to get face-to-face -face experience in the lab. Um, but uh, I think that the best, uh, so, so different labs are gonna be done differently. The best way to figure out what's happening is to talk to your instructor about his or her specific intentions for that particular lab that you're registered in. Thank you. Uh, another person would like to know, are professors fully familiar with Canvas? We, we started to make the transition to Canvas in the spring term. And uh, there is uh, uh, training sessions that are scheduled all throughout this, the, the summer. And uh, most of our faculty have been trained in Canvas are con and are continuing to be trained in Canvas. So by the time you get um, to, to campus in the fall, all of our faculty would have been trained and would know how to use Canvas. Canvas is the platform that we will be using for all our courses in the fall, supplemented by um, something like Zoom when necessary. Um, the, another question is, is there any update on when we are allowed to get books for our classes? And if so, where from? Okay, so um, I know a little bit about this, but somebody out there like Bob, uh, sorry, Dr. Gregerson might have additional information. So we are transitioning um, uh, our bookstore and uh, some, the option, one option that students will have in the fall that they don't have now is the option to purchase all of their books um, uh, as a unit, which means that the student will be paying a fixed price. Uh, they will be getting a bundled option which offers a discount on uh, the price that the student would pay for their um, uh, textbooks. And students will have the opportunity to have all of their books shipped to them at home, or they will have the option uh, where possible to pick up their books at the campus bookstore. So if you haven't gotten any information yet about that, look in, uh, continue to watch your inbox because there will be information coming your way soon about how you can access your your textbook. Okay, we'll answer one more question and then in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next presenter because I know some of these questions are regarding some other issues. Um, if you are waitlisted for a class and it will be online only, are you going to open up the class for more students? That's something that we can discuss with the instructor. Um, the online, um, the, the beauty of the online piece is that we don't have physical restrictions, uh, but the nature of the class could possibly restrict the numbers depending on what the instructor has to do. So the most effective online classes are not necessarily huge classes. So that I would again, um, uh, just continue to what, do what you normally do. If you want to get into a class, get on the wait list, and then we will inform you about whether or not um, you can you will be put into the class. Okay, thank you, Jackie and Beth. We'll move on to um, uh, Mr. Blehash. We'll have you present next, and then we'll continue to open up for questions. Okay, thanks, Lee. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm here this afternoon to give you a brief summary of some of the measures that we're taking inside campus buildings and uh, explain some of the features that you'll see whenever you arrive on campus in the fall. Uh, in facilities, our primary concern is uh, to intensify our housekeeping measures in common areas. Uh, our custodians are prepared to conduct multiple rounds of cleaning daily, um, especially of heavy contacted surfaces like door handles, light switches, elevator buttons, handrails, and faucet handles. Uh, 
Um, you'll see touchless hand sanitizer stations located across campus uh, on high travel routes. So in between some of the, uh, the classroom buildings, um, in the lobbies when you first enter those buildings, and um, in residence halls, primarily at, at common nodes like circulation desks and main departmental contacts. Um, we'll also have self-serve spray disinfectant kits. Uh, those will be located throughout the facilities um, to kind of fill in the gaps in between our routine um, custodial care. You'll notice that uh, bathroom fixtures have been placed out of order. Uh, this will allow for appropriate physical distancing uh, when multiple users are, are in the bathrooms. Um, you'll see that building signage will be installed in some of the facilities that encourages one-way foot traffic in hallways, uh, similar to grocery stores if you've been there. Uh, some stairs may be up or down only, uh, but we're still working on detailed sign placement uh, for all of the building signage. All of the classrooms will be provided with disinfectant wipes. Uh, our current thought is that students will wipe down their own chair and desk and table at the end of each class period. And um, these wipes will also be available for those folks who are wishing to do so before class starts. So each classroom will be equipped with that. And each classroom will al also uh, be, uh, be electrostatically fogged um, in the evening uh, whenever no class, classes are in session. And uh, this will just provide another level of disinfectant to, uh, to the classroom itself. Speaking of classrooms, uh, all of the classroom capacities have been analyzed for appropriate physical distancing. And the seat configurations in those rooms have been revised within each space. As Dr. Horrell explained briefly earlier in the presentation, the available seating capacity in these classrooms have been reduced to a third to a quarter uh, of each room's original capacity. So um, the available seats in each classroom, as well as lounges and the library, uh, will be identified by stickers. And I'll hold up a sticker. It, they kind of look like this, seat available. Um, so you'll be able to actually, it'll be very clear as, as what seats are, are appropriately distanced. Those seats will be moved to their correct locations at the end of every night. So that's a, a short, presentation on the facilities end of things. We will continue to communicate with you uh, through several outlets like email and social media from this point forward. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone in the fall. Can I add one thing? Um, our Joe, do you want to talk about um, safety um, wear for everybody on campus, face covering, etc.? Sure, sure. Uh, so as, as part of our continued uh, practice of, of safe social distancing and, and PPE. Everyone that uh, arrives on campus will uh, be required to uh, have a face covering of some sort uh, in place uh, to enter any university building and also in the outside spaces whenever appropriate physical distancing isn't possible. Um, the university does have um, some masks on hand for those of uh, those people who may have uh, forgotten theirs or don't have one uh, that we can provide to you. But it will be, it's our understanding that uh, everyone will be uh, asked to provide their own face covering whenever you come to campus. Thank you, Joe. I, I don't see any questions at this point that aren't already going to be answered later in some of the other presentations, but if you have any questions, feel free to drop those into the Q&A um, and we'll get back to those. So um, at this time, we will move on to Mr. Troy Ross. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I know some of you out there are excited to get back to campus. Uh, it was a pretty abrupt end um, for our return uh, students who are here in the spring um, and how we had to leave uh, during spring break. So we're excited to have everyone back. Um, however, when you come back, uh, clearly it's not going to be quite the same. Um, and I just kind of want to talk about a few of those things. And then um, we should have got some information about move-in, but I'm going to let Brian uh, go over it in case you missed that. Um, so um, <clears throat> we, of course, uh, living in the halls, we want it to be uh, fun, um, exciting for everyone. But uh, above all, we want it to be safe. Um, so there's going to be some things that are a little bit different this year. Um, so um, 
those things are in place so that everyone who lives there, we hope will be as safe as possible um, and we're mitigating any, any risk here. Um, so uh, one thing is, as uh, Mr. Bleehash said, uh, masks are gonna be required. Um, so if you are in the residence hall, to enter the residence hall, you have to wear a mask. You don't have to wear it in your room, but if you come outside your room, you will have to wear a mask. So, so if you're in the laundry room, um, in one of the study rooms, uh, anything like that, you are expected to wear a mask. So um, just wanna make sure everyone is aware of that. Um, uh, speaking of lounges, uh, we are going to, do, going to be discouraging any large gatherings in the lounge. Um, we want everyone to, uh, to practice physical distancing, even in the residence halls. So um, if you decide to use one of the lounges, we are gonna want students to uh, maintain that six foot distance um, in, throughout the entire uh, space. Um, something that we're still working through and trying to figure out the safest way to do it is visitation. Um, but there will definitely be some changes to that. One of the ones that we are uh, most likely having to implement is that we are, we probably are not going to be, you're not going to be permitted to have students or anyone from off campus visit you in the residence halls. This would include family. So um, after move in, um, you wouldn't be able to have someone come and visit you, uh, mom, dad, brother, sister, cousin, friend, girlfriend. They won't, they won't be able to come visit you most likely in the hall. They can come to campus, they can wait outside, they can pick you up, um, but they, they won't be permitted to, to enter the building. Um, there will be some other uh, limitations that we're looking at. We still have to kind of put all the details together. Um, once we have that, we'll make sure that students are aware of all of those uh, limitations that we've had to put in place this year. Um, but I wanna make sure that uh, everyone knows there will be some changes to visitation. Um, we had some questions come through about um, what's going to happen in the spring. The information that's going out to students has talked about the fall, um, everything kind of wrapping up before Thanksgiving. Um, and so the question that we've been getting, are students going to be expected to take all of their belongings <clears throat> and move out of the residence hall for uh, after the fall? Um, and, you know, right now that's not the plan. Um, you know, we have to wait and see what things look like, but that's not uh, the plan that I've been um, notified of. Uh, so uh, our intention is that there will be students here um, in the spring. Um, clearly, um, the intensity of the pandemic could, could cause Pitt to have to make uh, a change to that plan. But right now, the intention is to have students return um, in the fall. So, um, so that's all I kind of want to touch on right now. I'm sure there are some other questions, but I'm gonna let Brian talk real quick about uh, move in and then we'll, then we'll answer questions. Okay, thank you, Troy. Um, so at this point, students living on, on campus in the fall have already been uh, communicated with in terms of our plan for move-in. Uh, but just to summarize that, uh, right now we are working on a plan to move our students in over a four-day period. And the reason we've done this is to really promote physical and social distancing and to limit the number of people and family members who are coming in and out of the residence halls at any one point in time. So right now, um, we have our first year students moving in on Saturday and Sunday, August 15th and 16th, and our returning students moving in the following Monday and Tuesday, August 17th and 18th. About a week from today, you will be receiving your assigned move-in day and move-in shift. Uh, you will be assigned a day and you will either be assigned the 9 a.m. to noon shift or the 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. shift. All right, so it'll be really important that you um, that you stick to that schedule uh, and we're doing this in a way uh, in an organized way to limit the number of people not just moving in or out of a specific hall but even moving in it in your specific room it is not very likely that you will be moving in at the same time as a roommate we are going to try to avoid that um, this way we don't have five to ten people coming and going from your residence hall room at any given point um, so look for that information in your PIT email next week. Uh, once we do our new student assignments early next week, then we can assign everybody a move-in day and time. Um, we have been working with our students who live a little further away, students who live more than 100 miles from campus. We have um, been receiving their preferences and we will do what we can to accommodate requests to move in on a specific day and time. Um, 
it'll be really important as everyone has already indicated things are going to look different on campus this fall and that will start with move in when you arrive on campus all of the guidelines that we have in place on campus will start then and so that means wearing face coverings uh, when you arrive to campus keep maintaining uh, social and physical distancing um, you know, we in some of the things that we are doing, we're asking you not to bring any more than two guests with you when you move in, uh, to limit the number of people that the outsiders that we have on campus, and um, even considering bringing your own moving uh, materials. So, uh, returners are familiar that we do have moving carts on campus, and while we do plan on making those available to students, uh, much like when you go to a grocery store, you. Um, at most stores, you are you have the ability to sanitize the cart on the way in. We are going to have that ab ab availability for students to do, but the safest option is for you to bring your own cart or hand truck with you if you have that uh, capability. Uh, we will have sanitizing stations in the lobbies of all of our areas and um, proper signage and, and all of the things that you would expect to see when you get here. Uh, we will have that all ready for move-in day. Um, one thing I will note is that we will have um, an express drive-through check-in process for all of our students, uh, new students and returners uh, on the four move-in days. You will come straight to campus and near the Smith Hall parking lot we will have a tent set up where you will receive your keys and your check-in materials. So you will not report directly to your building, uh, you will report to that tent. You will not even need to get out of the car. We will have everything set up to hand you your materials and then you will be able to um, head to your respective residence hall. So right now that's kind of the plan for move in. We will have more details and you will receive your assigned day and time next week. Thanks. We have a couple questions in the chat that are asking about masks. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, what if a student is not able to wear a mask? Maybe they have a breathing condition where they are unable to wear a mask. Yeah, um, I don't know if Rick's still on, but I haven't seen any guidance on exactly how we're going to be uh, addressing that. Is there someone who has information on that? Yeah, <clears throat> I can briefly try to address it. I think it, we're really waiting for guidance from the Pitt Healthcare Advisory Group a number of the questions that have been asked, unfortunately, that is our response at this time. And you've already been very patient, and we just have to ask you to be a little bit more patient. I'm sure that the advisory group will come up with a mechanism um, to try to uh, allow students who have a medical condition. Uh, there will be some accommodation for that. I, I'm pretty certain of that. Um, but when they are, obviously it's going to be a couple of weeks yet, but it'll be shortly. And I expect that they'll come up with a mechanism and student services and I assume other departments will help convey that information to you as soon as it's released. So we have um, another question, Troy, regarding the residence halls. Um, are the residence halls being filled to capacity? And our rooms like um, in College Hall and Robert Shaw, will the beds be placed six feet apart? All right, so um, I'll start with College Hall. You know, most years we have to triple those rooms. Um, we actually are only doubling the rooms there. Um, University Court, occasionally we've had to put a fifth student in those rooms. We won't be doing that this year. There'll only be four. Um, so all the other spaces will be um, you know, the occupancy will be the same, so four in the village, four in Westmoreland Hall, um, two in Robert Shaw Road. Um, you know, we'll, we, we'll be placing the, you know, the beds as far apart as they can get um, within the rooms. Uh, the, the way that um, the university is, is viewing this based on CDC guidelines, the students that live together are considered almost like a family unit. Um, so uh, that's why there's not expectations for you to wear a mask with in, uh, inside of your room or anything like that. So, um, you know, th those concerns as far as um, distancing and stuff within the rooms aren't, don't really apply to the students who are living together. Okay, and we'll ask one more question before we have to move on. When we move in, will there, will there be officials checking to make sure that students do not have the virus? 
I have not been given any uh, indication that there's going to be any type of official screening um, that's going to occur. Um, I, I know that uh, the Dean has heard that they might have some type of online app that they are trying to develop um, down at the Pittsburgh campus. Um, but I have not been told that we will be doing any type of screening. Um, and usually the next question is, will there be a required quarantine? I haven't been told to be a required quarantine or anything like that for anyone that's coming come to campus. But I do want to say that uh, we, we will have procedures in place um, if someone um, tests positive or if there's been exposure um, to, uh, to the coronavirus. So um, we, we certainly will be able to handle that. We'll have spaces uh, that are set aside um, for, for those uh, occasions with or someone test, test positive um, and other procedures when someone has just been exposed. Okay, thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to our last presenter um, and then continue to open it up for questions. So uh, Dean Fogel, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Lee. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I know there's already been some questions regarding uh, dining services, and I'll try to address those first. Um, just like with the classrooms, all dining facilities have had their seating capacities adjusted. So we have um, set guidelines for the dining hall, for the Bobcat, and for the coffee house. Um, and we will have, um, you know, availability of that during the regular hours. Um, while we are under the guarded risk, um, mode of operation, we will be maintaining um, hours of operation uh, just like they have been in the past. Uh, all facilities such as Chambers Hall, the fitness center, um, dining facility hours, those will, at this point, they're going to stay the same. We don't expect changes with those. Um, Okay, um, meal plans will stay the same. Menus will stay the same. Uh, there will be some lim you know, limitations, both in terms of how it's prepared but, uh, or, and what's available. But most things, it's our intent to keep things um, the way they have been in the past. Um, one change that will occur for sure will be that there will no longer be any self-service available in the dining hall. All items will be served by a Chartwell's associate. Um, and to alleviate some of the lines and, uh, and wait times, we are going to expand takeout or pick up to go items so students can pre-order as well as uh, just pick up pre-made items. But throughout all of this, our intent in student services is to keep things as, as close to normal as they've been to previous operations, every, previous years. That's the intent at this time under the guarded risk mode. I know there's been some questions about um, activities. Um, there was one question about blue and gold, I believe. Uh, at this point, most of the blue and gold activities, homecoming week activities will be virtual. There may be a, a few in-person events, but um, at this point, they will be uh, virtual activities. The intent within um, other student activities is to do a combination, kind of a hybrid flex model in terms of student programs. Um, student Activities Board, Student Government Association have already taken the lead to develop programs, both virtual as well as some in-person programs uh, that we can offer in the fall. I know the Village has several exciting virtual uh, and I believe in-person programs planned uh, for the fall also. Um, and we certainly hope, I certainly encourage other student organizations to partner with us and actually take the lead in trying to develop programs for all students to create as dynamic of a community 
to help students interact with each other um, throughout the fall term during this time. Um, other facility questions have been uh, the fitness center, gym, things of that nature, we expect to keep the same. Um, the commuter mentors, the peer leaders have all been trained. They're all interacting with their students uh, now or will be shortly. And uh, we hope that students will take advantage of those programs to um, interact with their peers as an upper class mentors uh, to get as assistance as needed. And if there's issues, you can certainly communicate with them or any of the staff to uh, share those concerns so that we can address them. My intent is that all student services offices will be open. There may be limited staffing, um, but whatever the issue is, whether that's a career issue or an ID issue, um, an activity related issue, we would be able to address them. Um, there'll be somebody in the office to assist you on campus. And um, you should receive in the next couple of weeks, uh, freshmen, new students anyway, information about how to submit your photo for your student ID. And um, we will be able to process your photo uh, create the ID card, and then we will be able to distribute that the, uh, to you the first week of class is the plan that right now. I want to thank everybody again for their patience. Uh, this is certainly a dynamic influx kind of process. Uh, things are changing, and I apologize we can't answer more of your questions with specific answers, but that's our intent, and we will continue to communicate with you uh, over the next month um, as we prepare for the fall term. And thank you. So we do have a question that asks, will masks be required while working out in the fitness center? Well, that's another one of those uh, healthcare advisory groups. <laughs> um, uh, we've asked that question. Um, and so we will wait for guidance about whether that's required. Um, I don't believe most clubs are private clubs, so I'm assuming, but I just won't, wouldn't be able to say at this point, but it is a question we've asked. We w the fitness center will be open, but we know we will have to spread out the machines and, um, you know, we will not be able to be at 100% capacity, um, but fortunately, if we maintain the hours, I think, most students will be able to access the machine and equipment um, when it's con convenient for them. And um, that's what we're gonna continue to work on. Uh, we have another question that asks, um, are the academic village requirements still in place? And I believe Sheila is working on that. Uh, we um, talked about it earlier this week. I think her plan is yes, there will be requirements, um, but what the extent of those requirements and how you can you know, fulfill them uh, is still up in, this, in discussion. So the village will be communicating with its members uh, again, probably around mid-August, so that you'll know what, what is expected. Uh, and then there's a final question in the Q&A that asks, are rooms like the commuter lounge or rooms in Smith Hall still available for individual study or for classes or wait or waiting for classes, excuse me? I believe so, but maybe Joe, do you, is there any plan to change that or? Again, I would just, you know, furniture will be need to be moved and there will have to be physical distancing, but there still will be uh, opportunities to use the lounge spaces. Yeah, the plan for, for that is to remain in operation, um, but the furniture will be moved for appropriate distancing. Related to another facilities question, uh, how will the locker rooms work, especially showers? Um, is, is it one shower station for all we, they're talking about the, the showers in the locker rooms? 
I walked through uh, that space with uh, the folks that handle the, the uh, Chambers Hall and where the locker rooms are located. And we will be um, taking every other space offline. So there, where there are individual uh, showers that every other one will be available. And um, we will be appropriately marking the lockers that are available too. So yes, we're uh, the, the, the capacity in each one of those spaces is greatly reduced as well. Um, another question is, when will the determination of students not being able to wear a mask be made? Um, because if a student is planning to live on campus who has a medical condition, they would need to have this information as soon as possible. Um. Again, the Pet Healthcare Advisory Group has been working on these issues, uh, but I would not be able to say, but I would expect, um, what I've been told actually is that by the end of July, um, from my counterpart at the Oakland campus, they hope to have that answer by the end of July, uh, the week of the 27th. And um, so I guess we would hope certainly that by August 1st, we would be able to communicate with you and tell you what, what is required. Um, so I think we've asked, answered most of the questions. Um, but there, there are just a, another couple few questions coming in. Um, if students are walking in hallways, buildings on grounds and to and from buildings, will they have to stay six feet apart? Joe, do you have an answer on that or? You know, all of the communication that I have seen is um, uh, regarding masks. So obviously if we are um, inside a facility, we have masks on all the time, um, obviously except inside the dining facility and um, outside where physical distancing is not possible. Um, I have seen communication that says um, within six feet for a period of longer than five minutes. Um, but again, we're going to default back to the CDC and state health guidelines for, for all of those, um, uh, all those instances. But inside the buildings, you know, everyone, everyone should have be wearing masks at all times, um, whenever, whenever possible. Okay, thank you. Um, looks like a number of the questions have been answered in the Q&A. So people have been responding. Um, with, with typed answers or, or we have an answered those live. Um, I don't see any further questions at this point. If anybody would like to submit any final questions, we'll take those over the Q&A. Okay, there's a few more coming in. Um, Will professors still have office hours and can I just drop by or do I need to schedule? I don't know, Jackie or Frank, if you want to take that. Yeah, um, the syllabi, the, the, the course syllabi that a student will receive, um, well, let's put it this way, each syllabus will ha should have uh, uh, clear information on there about how the instructor plans to um do office hours the answer to will there be office hours yes will there be drop in uh i, I i'm not sure of the answer to that but i'm thinking that with in order to maintain social distancing uh it might be wiser uh to have appointments so that uh, people will know when others are coming so that the, the, the offices don't get crowded um, because you have to maintain that six foot distance if you're inside the building. Um, if the class is uh, being done remotely, then there will also be office hours, but they will be held differently. Your instructor will tell you how that will be done. I know last time some office hours were held um, uh, sort of over via Zoom where people can actually interact uh, that way. Um, there were specific hours that were set Oftentimes it might have been in during the time when class was scheduled. 
and in other cases uh, appointments were taken so it depends on the instructor and you'll find out um, on the first day of classes how it will be done um, and somebody would like to know where will there be remote and in-person tutoring uh, we're working on it and we're planning to have some in-person tutoring and some remote tutoring. We want to make sure that uh, the student, uh, as much as possible, have access to the help that they need, whether they are away from campus or they're here. So um, there will be some combination. We're working it out right now to see exactly what it's going to look like. Thank you, Jackie. Um, so I think we have answered most of the questions and I know we're, we're close to our time. Um, I do want to um, let the students know that if you have further questions, um, you're welcome to re reach out to any of the panelists or any faculty or staff on campus who um, will be able to answer that for you. Um, please make sure you are keeping an eye on your PIT email as we will be giving updates um, through that and also on the PIT website there will be information posted uh, you know we are we know that this is a, a fluid situation so things could be changing but we'll do the best we can to make sure that you get the uh, answers to all of your questions so um, please reach out to do so um, somebody had asked if this would be posted this recording would be posted later and yes we will be posting the recording of this webinar on our website so um, you can uh, check that out and if you have if you'd like to review any of the information we covered um, thank you to all the panelists who uh, presented today and thank you um, everybody for attending so thanks thank you